This week's block of scripture that we are considering is 3rd Nephi, chapters 12 through 16. Because of there's so much doctrine in these chapters, I've divided this presentation into two parts just because of the length of it. So first of all, in part one, we will consider 3rd Nephi, chapters 12 through 13. So we'll take a look at chapters 12 and 13 now as part 1. 3 Nephi 12 through 14, an introduction, Sermon on the Mount. In his mortal ministry, Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount to encourage disciples to strive towards perfection with full purpose of heart. Following his resurrection, Jesus appeared to the Book of Mormon people in the Western Hemisphere and again delivered this sermon. The gospel standards contained in this sermon have been reaffirmed in our time through modern prophets. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency observed, The Savior's transcendent message in the Sermon on the Mount is of burning bush importance to all of us. But seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish His righteousness. This message needs to penetrate into our hearts and souls. As we accept this message, we are taking our personal standards we are taking our personal standard in this life, end of quote. The Sermon on the Mount, contained in both the Bible and the Book of Mormon, is the Lord's blueprint for perfection. Of this sermon, President Harold B. Lee said, quote, Christ came not only into the world to make an atonement for the sins of mankind, but to set an example before the world of the standard of perfection of God's law and of obedience to the Father. In his Sermon on the Mount, the Master has given us somewhat of a revelation of his own character, which was perfect, or what might be said to be an autobiography, every syllable of which ha he had written down in deeds, and in, doing, in so doing he has delivered us a blueprint for our own lives. End of quote. So with that, let's turn to 3 Nephi chapter 12. 12 verses 1 through 2. These introductory remarks by the Savior provide an important doctrinal context for the Beatitudes. They set forth the important concept that the Beatitudes are given primarily for the saints, for members of the Church of Jesus Christ who have come out of the world, put behind them the doings and desires of Babylon, received the gospel ordinances, accepted and received the Lord's anointed servants, and committed themselves to Christ and his kingdom. So the Sermon on the Mount was not meant for non-members. It was meant for those who have already entered the gate through baptism. Chapter 12, verse 1. He stretched forth his hand unto the multitude. Jesus' sermon in Galilee was directed almost exclusively to the twelve, though there were no doubt other disciples present. The Sermon on the Mount was essentially an apostolic preparation address, a type of missionary training center for special witnesses. The Bountiful Sermon in 3 Nephi was delivered both to the 12 Nephite apostles and to a multitude of other faithful people. In Bountiful, whenever Jesus desired to deliver up a specific message to the multitude or to the 12, Mormon's account makes special notice of it. Chapter 12, verse 1, the phrase, Blessed are ye if ye shall receive, heed, give heed unto the words of these twelve whom I have chosen. The Savior began his sermon to the Nephites by calling attention to the importance of following the twelve Nephite disciples whom he had called and given power and authority. Modern revelation has also emphasized the safety and blessings that come by following the Lord's chosen servants. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained why it is of critical importance for us to follow the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles today. Quote, The apostolic and prophetic foundation of the Church was to bless in all times, but especially in times of adversity or danger, times when we might feel like children, confused or disoriented, perhaps a little fearful, times in which the devious hand of men or the maliciousness of the devil would attempt to unsettle or mislead. Again, such times as come in our modern day, the first presence in the Quorum of the Twelve are commissioned by God and sustained by you as prophets, seers, and revelators. Such a foundation in Christ was and always is always to be a protection in such days as we now are in and will be or more or will be 
will more or less always be in. The storms of life shall have no power over you. End of quote. Though the words disciples used throughout 3 Nephi to describe those chosen to minister to the Nephite multitudes, there seems to be no question but they were apostles. They were, in fact, disciples, followers of Christ before Jesus appeared in America. They were called to be special witnesses and were granted apostolic powers. Chapter 12, verse 1. The phrase, I will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Sorry, there's a typo, an extra one in there. I will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. It is through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, by means of the Holy Spirit, that men and women are sanctified from sin, cleansed and purified from the effects of their transgressions. Brothers and sisters, it's the Holy Ghost that cleanses from sin, not the waters of baptism. The waters of baptism are symbolic of the death and resurrection of Christ. Holy Ghost is one who cleanses us of sin. Chapter 12, verse 2, the phrase, and ye shall receive a remission, and shall receive a remission of their sins. Sins are remitted not in the waters of baptism, as we say in speaking figuratively of washing away our sins, but rather than the sanctifier, the Holy Ghost burns dross and filth out of our souls as though by fire. Wherefore, Nephi counsel, quote, do the things which I have told you that I have seen your Lord and your Redeemer should do. For, for this cause have they been shown unto me, that ye might know the gate by which ye should enter. For the gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism by water. And then cometh a remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. Chapter 12, verses 3 through 12, the Beatitudes. The Savior Sermon begins with declarations referred to as the Beatitudes. These start with a series of statements that declare blessed are. Beatitude means to be fortunate, to be happy, to be blessed. Webster Dictionary defines the word as a state of utmost bliss. Such words describe the results when saints apply the teachings of this sermon. Chapter 12, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit who come unto me. President Harold B. Lee defined what it means to be poor in spirit. Quote, the master said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit, of course, means those who are spiritually needy, who feel so impoverished spiritually that they reach out with great yearning for help. Every one of us, if we would reach perfection, must one time ask ourselves this question, what lack I yet, if we would commence our climb towards our highway to perfection? End of quote. The phrase, who come unto me, is not found in the New Testament version of the Sermon on the Mount, but is clear, it clarifies the Savior's teaching. It is blessed to be poor in spirit if we come unto Christ. The Savior described in 3 Nephi 12, 2, how we begin to come unto him. The statement, who come unto me, can in principle also be applied to other beatitudes. In order to be comforted, verse 4, inherit the earth, verse 5, be filled with the Holy Ghost, verse 6, obtain mercy, verse 7, or see God, verse 8, verse 8 we must come unto Christ. As the Savior led in his, holy, in his sermon about coming unto him, he mentioned baptism 19 times, third Nephi 11, between 3 Nephi 11.21 and 12.2. To completely come unto Christ includes accepting the ordinances of salvation. President Ezra Taft Benson described additional ways we can come unto Christ. Quote, come unto Christ through proclaiming the gospel, perfecting our lives, and redeeming our dead. As we come unto Christ, we bless our own lives, those of our families, and our Father in heaven's children, both living and the dead. End of quote. The footnote from Matthew 5.38b also explains the poor in spirit as the poor in pride, those who are able to cast off the cares, burdens, and riches of the world, to cast off worldliness, and set their hearts upon the riches of eternity. Chapter 12, verse 4, the phrase, Blessed are they that mourn. 
Those who are poor in spirit, who are broken in spirit, sad of spirit, or depressed, or those who are sin-laden and thereby spiritually bankrupt, cannot be saved on their own. Those who mourn because of their weakness, our fallen nature, will receive comfort by yielding to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, and putteth off the natural man, and becometh a saint to the atonement of Christ the Lord, and become as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child to submit to his father. A knowledge and witness of the plan of salvation also brings comfort to those who mourn because of the loss of loved ones. Elder Spencer J. Condi in the 70 explained how the Beatitudes can be seen as progressive in nature. Quote, the Beatitudes may be viewed as a recipe for righteousness with incremental steps, beginning with the poor in spirit who come unto him or come unto Christ. The next step in the celestial direction is to mourn, especially for our sins, for godly sorrow work through repentance to salvation. End of quote. Chapter 12, verse 5, Blessed are the meek. The meek are those who voluntarily humble themselves. themselves. Those who are the God-fearing and the righteous seldom hold title to much of that which appertains to this present world. They shall be the Lord's jewels and inherit the earth as the celestial kingdom. Elder Bruce A. McConkie said it this way, quote, Few virtues have such inherent worth as meekness, for the meek are the God-fearing and the righteous. They are the ones who willfully conform to the gospel standards, thus submitting their will to the will of the Lord. They are not the fearful, the spiritless, the timid. Rather, the most forceful, dynamic personality who ever lived said of himself, I am meek and lowly in heart. End of quote. So meekness is so voluntarily choosing to be humble, not compelled to be humble because of circumstances. President Spencer W. Kim explained that meekness is not weakness. Quote, if the Lord was meek and lowly and humble, then to become humble one must do what he did, in boldly denouncing evil, bravely advancing righteous works, courageously meeting every problem, becoming the master of himself and the situation about him, and being near oblivious to personal credit. Humility is not pretentious, presumptuous, nor proud. It is not weak, vil facilitating nor surveil. Humble and meek properly suggest, suggest virtues, not weakness. They suggest a constant mild of temper and an absence of wrath and passion. It is not servile submissiveness. It is not coward nor frightened. How does one get humble? To me, one must constantly be reminded of his dependency. On whom dependent? On the Lord. How remind oneself? By real, constant, worshipful, worshipful, grateful prayer. End of quote. To inherit the earth is to reside in the celestial kingdom. In a sense, this earth will eventually become the celestial kingdom. Chapter 12, verse 5. Blessed are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness. As starving men crave a crust of bread, as choking men thirst for water, or do... Or so do the righteous yearn for the Holy Ghost. To hunger and thirst after righteousness is to yearn with one, with all one's soul for the things of the Spirit, to crave that goodness of character and that nobility of soul which grace the ancient worthies, to want more than anything else to enjoy the fruits of the Spirit and gifts and signs and wonders which also which always accompany faith. To hunger and thirst after righteousness, to have an eye single to the glory of God, to desire what the Lord desires, to feel what He feels, to strive to do what He would do under similar circumstances. To hunger and thirst after righteousness is to trust completely in the Savior, to re rely wholly upon His mercy and grace, to yield one heart unto God. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that the end result of hungering and thirsting after righteousness is the assurance of eternal life. 
while serving in the General Relief Society presidency, Sister Sherry L. Dew explained the connection between desire, hunger and thirsting, and action, or the ability to work to achieve the desired results. Quote, our ability to hear spiritually is linked to our willingness to work at it. President Higley has often said that the only way he knows how to get thing, anything done is to get on his knees and plead for help and then get on his feet and do the work. That combination of faith and hard work is the commensurate curriculum for learning the language of the Spirit. The Savior taught, Blessed are all they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they are filled with the Holy Ghost. Hungering and thirsting translate to sheer spiritual labor. Worshiping in the temple, repenting to become increasingly pure, forgiving and seeking forgiveness, and earnest fasting and prayer will increase our receptivity to the Spirit. Spiritual work works and is the key to learning to hear the voice of the Lord. End of quote. The phrase, they shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God sanctifies. It cleanses and purges filth and dross out of the human soul as though by fire. The Spirit does far more, however, than remove uncleanness. It also fills. It fills one with the holy element, with a sacred presence that motivates the person to a godly walk and godly works. These persons do not necessarily plan out how they will perform the work of righteousness. They do not plot and design what deeds and what actions are to be done in every situation. Rather, they are embodied right. They embody righteousness. They are goodness. End of quote. Chapter 12, verse 7. I think that last one should have been verse 6 instead of verse 5. Sorry. Chapter 12, verse 7. The phrase, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Every man is rewarded according to the deeds done in the flesh. Those who have mercy, manifest mercy to their fellow men here will be treated mercifully by the merciful one. Those who have acquired the godly attributes of mercy here shall have mercy restored unto them again in that bright day. Alma complained, explained to Corianton, quote, The meaning of the word restoration is to bring back again evil for evil, or carnal for carnal, or devilish for devilish, good for that which is good, righteous for that which is righteous, just for that which is just, merciful for that which is merciful. Therefore, my son, see that you are merciful unto your brethren. Then ye shall ye receive your reward. Yea, ye shall have mercy restored unto you again. Alma 41, 13-14. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Luke 6, 36. Chapter 12, verse 8, the phrase, Blessed are they, uh, blessed are all the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When we manage to live in such a way that our actions are above reproach, you're said to have clean hands. When we live in such a way that our desires are appropriate and are but reflections by your righteous actions, then we are said to be pure in heart. To be pure in heart is to be single, focused, riveted, aligned with the ways and will of the Almighty. It is to have no desire but the desire for righteousness. When a Latter-day Saint is pure in heart, he seeks to build up and establish the cause of Zion. Zion is the pure in heart. Elder Joseph B. Worland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained what it means to be pure in heart. Quote, to be without guile is to be pure in heart, an essential virtue of those who would be counted among true followers of Christ. If we are without guile, we are honest, true, and righteous. There are all, these are all attributes of deity and are required of the saints. Those who are honest are fair and truthful in their speech, straightforward in their dealings, free of deceit, and above stealing, misrepresentation, or any other fraudulent action. Honesty is of God, dishonesty of the devil, who was a liar from the beginning. Righteousness means living in a life that is in harmony with the laws, principles, and ordinances of the gospel. End of quote. Elder Bruce R. McConkie has written, quote, After the true saints receive the enjoy the gift of the Holy Ghost, after they know how to attune themselves to the voice of the Spirit, after they mature spiritually so that they see visions, work miracles, and entertain angels, after they make their calling and election sure and prove themselves worthy of every trust, after all this and more, 
it becomes their right and privilege to see the Lord and commune with him face to face. Revelations, visions, angelic visitations, the rendering of the heavens, and appearance among men of the Lord himself, all these things are for all the faithful. They are not received for apostles and prophets only. God is no respecter of persons. They are not reserved for one age only or for a select lineage of people. We are all our Father's children. All are welcome. End of quote. Chapter 12, verse 9. Blessed are all the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The Lord, her, the Lord here commissions his servants to do all they can to establish peace on earth. Treaties and agreements and armistice are but are to be applauded, but the only ultimate peace in the world will come through the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. His message, the gospel of salvation, is a message of peace. He brings peace, but not as the world does. To those who receive him, come unto him, obey him, follow him, and submit to him. His, he remits sin, and that brings peace. He study, steadies the troubled soul, which brings peace. He comforts the bereaved, which brings peace. He offers heavenly perspective, which brings peace. His spirit teaches the peaceable things of the kingdom. In addition, those whom he calls and sends forth in his name are peacemakers. These are they which bear glad tidings, which publish peace, even the message that God reigns. The gospel, the peace the gospel brings, Elder Dallin H. Oaks has taught, quote, is not just the absence of war, it is the opposite of war. Gospel peace is the opposite of any conflict, armed or unarmed. It is the opposite of national or ethnic hostilities of civil or family strife. By preaching righteousness, our missionaries seek to treat the causes of war. They preach repentance from personal corruption, greed, and oppression, because only by individual reformation can we overcome corruption and oppression by groups, as by groups or nations. By inviting all to repent and come unto Christ, our missionaries are working for peace in this world by changing the hearts and behavior of individual men and women. End of quote. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, described how to become a peacemaker. Quote, peacemakers, in the full sense, only those who believe and spread the fullness of the gospel are peacemakers, within the perfect meaning of this beatitude. The gospel is the message of peace to all mankind. Children of God, those who have been adopted into the family of God as a result of their devotion to the truth, by such a course they become heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, end of quote. And we also become the children of God as we respond to the gospel of peace by coming unto Christ. And now because of the covenant which you have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. Behold this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore ye are born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. Chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute. The world loves its own and hates the saints. The world is the carnal society created by evil men. It is made up of those who are carnal and sensual and devilish. Of course, the world persecutes the saints. The very thing that makes them saints is their enemy towards the things of the world. There is little joy in persecution itself. No one, not even the Holy One of Israel, joyed in persecution. It is not something to be desired, and certainly not something to be appreciated and enjoyed. The Lord's final beatitude is one of consolation. The true Christian will eventually be persecuted for his belief and way of life. In this he should not feel alone, nor should he be surprised, for he is in good company. The best blood of scores of generations have been shed by those who sought and maligned and eradicate the believers. And should the true believer be called upon to seal his witness through the giving of his life, then glory and honor and exaltation await him hereafter. And whosoever layeth down his life for my cause and for my name's sake shall find it again, even eternal life. 
The Eldest Bible Dictionary explains the Beatitudes describe certain elements that go to form the refined and spiritual character, and all of which will be present whenever that character exalts in its perfection. Rather than being isolated statements, the Beatitudes are interrelated and progressive in their arrangement. The Beatitudes are arranged in such a way that each statement builds upon the one that precedes it. This is shown in the following chart. So if you take a look at this chart, you can see the one, poor in spirit, those who recognize their spiritual need and come unto Christ through faith. Then that causes them to mourn because of their sins, the spirit of repentance. Thus then they voluntarily submit themselves to God. They become meek and they come unto Christ through the baptism or covenant with the Lord. And then because of this meekness, this voluntary humility, they hunger and thirst after righteousness. They seek the power of the Holy Ghost that sustains men in righteousness. And then they become merciful. Those who exhibit the fruits of the Spirit, such as mercy, kindness, and patience. And then as they are merciful and hunger and thirst after righteousness, those whose hearts have been purged of sin desire the power of the Holy Ghost. And then they become pure in heart. And then, then they can preach the gospel of peace. Those who exercise the gifts and fruits of the Spirit to soften men's hearts and persuade them to believe. They then preach the gospel of peace. That is a peacemaker. And then they will be persecuted for their righteousness. Those who willingly endure persecution and trials brought about because of their faith. The Beatitudes form the stairway to Christ, by which you can receive power from him to become like him. Remember, it takes effort to climb this stairway. The Beatitudes are the steps of perfection that enable us to truly love God and our fellow man. Notice that every one of these eight Beatitudes are attributes of Jesus Christ. And so as I climb this stairway of Beatitudes, I am putting on the, beat, the attributes of of Jesus Christ and becoming more like him. Steps 1 through 4 teach us how to love God. Steps 5 through 7 teach us how to love our fellow man. And then step 8 teaches us to reach beyond loving our fellow man and learn to love our enemies. And so you can see the spiritual progressive nature of the Beatitudes. This is how you and I will become perfected in Christ. We must climb these steps. Chapter 12, verse 13, Salt of the Earth. The Book of Mormon account indicates that to be the salt of the earth is the goal members of the church should strive for. In the Mosaic sacrificial ritual, salt was a reminder that we should remember and preserve our covenants with God. That this council was directed primarily to members of the church is evident from a modern revelation. This is from DNC 101. When, quote, when men are called into my everlasting gospel, that Savior declared, and covenant with an everlasting covenant, they are accounted as the salt of the earth and the Savior of men. They, I'm oh, sorry, that should be men. The saints are asked to stand as a spice, a seasoning, a flavor among the bland and often tasteless elements of the world. Because they are these things, these things are better. Like salt, the people of the Lord are empowered to bring out the best in others. In reality, we can only make a difference if we are different, not necessarily strange different. Indeed, disciples of Christ are to stand in stark contrast to those who conform, concede, and thereby compromise. Sight is, salt is a healing medium. Like oil on troubled water, the disciple of Christ is sent forth to bear others' burdens, to comfort the distress, to mourn with those that face calamity. As a peacemaker, he is called to sue, serve as a soothing balm in the midst of tragedy or controversy. 
So when he says you are to be the salt of the earth, is referring to our covenants. You are to be covenant people of Christ of the earth. And it's through covenants that I will preserve you and I will make you better and you will taste better and be better. And you will be a healing balm unto the world. Salt is a preservative. It preserves food from corruption, keeps it wholesome and acceptable. The disciples are likewise called to be a preservatives on earth. They are called out of the world to stand as witnesses against creeping relativity and the dilution of time-honored values. They are summoned by the Savior to declare with love and boldness those principles of light and virtue, those absolute truths decreed by an all-wise God and his prophets. A modern revelation declared they, the saints, were set to be a light unto the world and to be the saviors of men. And as much as they are not the saviors of men, they are as the salt has lost its savior. We know with interest the number of times in Scripture the Lord warns the wicked that as much as they are cast out, as much as they cast out the prophets and the righteous element from among them, they are ripe for destruction. To dispel the nucleus of faith is to sever, sever the very lifeline which could pull them through the storms of life into a safe harbor. And so if we lose our covenants, brothers and sisters, then we are good for nothing. We must stay on the covenant path. Elder Carlos E.S.A. explained to priesthood holders, quote, when men are called into my everlasting gospel and covenant with an everlasting covenant, they are counted as the salt of the earth and the savor of men. They are called to be the savor of men. The word savor denotes taste, pleasing flavor, interesting quality, and high repute. A world-renowned chemist told me that salt will not lose its savor with age. Salt is lost through, lost through mixture and contamination. Similarly, priesthood power does not dissipate with age. It too is lost through mixture and cam contamination. Flavor and quality flee a man when he contaminates his mind with unclean thoughts, desecrates his mouth by speaking less than the truth, and misapplies his strength in performing evil acts. I would offer this simple guidelines, these simple guidelines, especially to the young men, as the means to preserve one's savor. It is not clean. Do not think of it. If it is not true, do not speak it. If it is not good, do not do it. End of quote. Chapter 12, verses 14 through 16. I give unto you to be the light of this people. Elder Bruce R. McConkie declared, We are to be the choicest and best people on earth, and we must now be an example to all men that others seeing our good works will come unto Christ and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Salt and light are symbols of the saints. Salt because it has a seasoning, purifying, preserving power. Light because it manifests the good works and wise words of the true believers. The saints as the salt of the earth are set forth to season their fellow man, to keep society free from corruption, to help their fellow beings become wholesome, pure, and acceptable before the Lord. The saints as the light of the world are set a good example of good works and charitable deeds, so they may say to all men, as does their master, Come, follow thou me, and I will lead you in sure paths here and to heights above the clouds hereafter. Christ is the light. Therefore hold up your light, that it may shine unto the Lord, unto the world. Behold, I am the light which ye should hold up. That which ye have seen me do. We are at best lamps, dim reflections of him. But to the degree that the light of the Spirit shines in our souls, to the degree that his image is in our countenance, to the degree that our good works motivate others to sing the song of redeeming love and glorify God, we are in the line of our duty as disciples. Chapter 12, verses 17 through 20. In Christ, the law of Moses is fulfilled. By the time of the Savior's mortal ministry, the law of Moses had been at the foundation of Israelite religious and social life for over a thousand years. The Nephites possessed written records of the law on the brass plates, and the Nephite prophets taught and observed the law. When the Savior visited the Nephites, he taught them that the law had been completely fulfilled in him. 
However, they were not to think of the law of Moses as destroyed or having passed away. How is it that the Savior fulfilled but did not destroy the law of Moses? The law of Moses included both moral and ritual aspects. The moral aspects included such commandments as thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not commit adultery. Stephen E. Robinson, professor at BYU, writes, It is vital to note that in the teachings of Jesus, the law was not revoked nor repealed by fulfillment. Under the gospel of Christ, murder, adultery, and dishonesty are still prohibited, and the former requirements of the law are still essential in place. But the demand of the law of Moses has been expanded, has been filled to its fullest extent. Where there is no hatred or greed, there can be no murder. Where there is no lust, there can be no adultery. With the coming of Christ, the ethical portion of the law had not been abolished. It had been caught up by, included in, and expanded to a broader application of its intention. Its potential as an ethical standard had been fulfilled. The ceremonial, so therefore... When he says, therefore I say unto you, he that looketh upon a woman to even lust of her in her heart has committed adultery in his heart. See, if we will get rid of lust, then we will automatically get rid of adultery. It encompasses it. The law of Christ encompassed the law of Moses and that thou shall not commit adultery by adding a higher law. Thou shall not even lust. The ceremonial or ritual portion of the law, however, were fulfilled in a different way. These were not moral or ethical rules which could be transformed into broader principles, but were what Abinadi and Alma called performances, that is, rituals that symbolically prefigure coming historical events. For example, animal sacrifice prefigured the future sacrifice of the Savior, the Lamb of God. But when the events prefigured actually occurred, in other words, when Christ did sacrifice himself, they could no longer be anticipated. They could only be remembered. Therefore, when the Savior's mortal mission was completed, these forward-looking ordinances could no longer look ahead to a future event. The event had happened, and the ordinances were fulfilled in the sense that it had now been concluded. After the atonement of Christ, the anticipation of the event found in the law was replaced by the remembrance of the event, which is part of the gospel. Thus, those parts of the law which anticipated the atonement of Christ were fulfilled in the events of the atonement and had an end, just as prophecy is said to be fulfilled when the event prophesied takes place. And so now we look back in remembrance. We no longer have to look forward in future to the event. The event of Christ's sacrifice has been taken place. He spilt his blood. Therefore, we no longer need the spilling of the animal blood as a figure or a type of that. We now look back in the sacrament in remembrance of Christ's blood and crucifixion. Thus, Jesus did not abolish or do away with the commandments associated with the law. Rather, he pointed beyond the dead letter to the living spirit and intent of the law. He did not do away, for example, with the commandments against murder or adultery or the breaking of oaths. Instead, he invited disciples to ascend the ladder of spirituality to a higher level, to acquire a higher perspective on gospel living. Chapter 12, verse 19, A Broken Heart and a Contrite Spirit. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles testified of the value of having a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Quote, I witness that redemption comes in and through the Holy Messiah unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and to none else can the ends of the law be answered. This absolute requisite of a broken heart and a contrite spirit prescribes the need to be submissive, compliant, humble, that is teachable, and willingly obedient. End of quote. Chapter 12, verses 21 through 47. These are examples of the law of the gospel encompassing and expanding the law of Moses. So now he'll give examples as how the gospel, the law of Christ, 
encompassed and expanded the law of Moses. Chapters 12, oh, verse 5, and 21 through 22. Murder and anger. I think that's supposed to be chapter 12, verses Verses 21 through 22. Murder and anger. The same prohibition applied under the gospel law, but this higher law, in addition, raises a higher standard. It strikes at the cause of murder, which is anger. The man who fills bullets, the man who fired bullet, whose fired bullet misses its human target, is as guilty as the man, the marksman, whose bullet brings death to the intended victim. It is the feeling one has in the heart that counts, not the eventuality that occurs. And so, thou shalt not have anger towards one another encompasses thou shalt not murder. If we had no longer anger towards one another, see, it would completely get rid of murder. Chapter 12, verse 22, profanity. Raka is an Aramaic word literally meaning empty head, a statement of derision and abuse. And thou fool were epithets of profanity and vulgar speech. And when profanity and vulgar words are hurled at our fellow men, this leads to damnation. So get rid of your profanity, then we can get word of our vulgarity towards one another. Chapter 12, verse 23 through 24, reconciliation between brethren. Jesus speaks here not of our anger or ill feelings towards others, but of their ill feelings for whatever cause against us. No matter that we are the one, no matter that we are the one who had been wronged. The gospel standard calls for us to search out those whose anger is kindled against us and do and to do in all our power to drouse the fire of hate and animosity. Go thy way unto thy brother and first be reconciled to brother, he said to the Nephites, and then come unto me with full purpose of heart, and I will receive you. See, if we will reconcile between each other, whether we were the cause of the offense or not, but try to reconcile our differences with each other, then that encompasses the lower law. It encompasses the lower law of justifying having anger towards one another. It would get rid of that anger. Chapter 12, verses 25 through 26 Avoiding legal, legal entanglements. It was more important during their social and political circumstances that the Lord's servants suffer legal wrongs than their ministries be hindered or even stopped by legal processes. Perhaps even today we do not need to sue for every legal thing. And so he that asked thee for a cloak, give him thy cloak also. They ask a one mile, go twain. Avoid lingual entanglements. We don't have to have justice on every little thing. Show mercy. Chapter 12, verses 20 through 28, adultery. It is not the immoral act alone that the gospel condemns. It is also the lewd and lustful desires that leads to its commission. And so thou shalt not commit adultery, but now he's trying to say thou shalt not even lust. Verses, chapter 12, verses 29 through 30, casting sins away. J- the JST of Matthew 5, 32 through 34 says, Wherefore, if thy right, if I offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, not that the whole body should be cast into hell. Or if thy right eye hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of the members should perish, not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And now this I speak a parable concerning your sins. Wherefore, cast them from you, that ye may not be hewn down and cast into the fire. And so 29 through 30 is that we should just cast, cut out the sins from among us so that it doesn't bog us down into hell.
Thus, we need to deny ourselves of every sinful thing and take up the cross. Jesus said, and now for a man to take up his cross is to deny himself all ungodliness and every worldly lust and keep my commandments. Elder Neal I. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained the phrase, take up your cross. The daily taking up of the cross means daily denying ourselves the appetites of the flesh. By emulating the master who endured temptations but gave no heed to them, we too can live in a world filled with temptations such as are common unto man. Of course, Jesus noticed the tremendous temptations that came to him, but he did not process and reprocess them. Instead, he rejected them promptly. If we entertain temptations, soon they begin to entertain us. Turning these unwanted lodgers away at the doorstep of the mind is one way of giving no heed. Beside these would-be lodgers are actually barbarians who, if admitted, can be evicted only with great trauma. End of quote. Chapter 12, verses 31 through 32, he talks about the law of divorce. That in a celestial world, there is no such thing as divorce. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, Divorce is totally foreign to celestial standards, a verity that Jesus will one day expound in more detail to the people of Jewry. For now, as far as the record reveals, he merely specifies the higher law that his people should live. Beyond that is beyond our capability even today. If husband and wives live the law of the Lord as the Lord would have them live it, they would neither do nor say the things that would even permit the feeling thought of divorce to enter the mind of their eternal companions. Though we today have the gospel, we have yet to grow into that higher state of marital association where marrying a divorced person constitutes adultery. The Lord has not yet given us the higher standard he here named as that which ultimately will replace the mosaic practice of writing a bill of divorcement. So in the celestial kingdom there is no divorcement. Living the celestial law, marrying someone who has been divorced would be committed in fornication. We do not live this higher law yet. We are still living the Mosaic law where God permits in our day divorce. He still permits that. We have yet to reach that higher law. Chapter 12, verses 33 through 37. Gospel oaths. Anciently they made oaths. Christ now says we can do away with that. There's a higher law. Abraham and the agents who lived by gospel standards were permitted to take oaths to swear in the Lord's name, thus certifying that, the would, that they would act or speak in a named way. Such a certification guaranteed their words because the oath made God their partner, and God cannot lie or fail. The words they then spoke became the Lord's words and were accepted as truth, and the deeds they vowed by an oath to do became the Lord's performances, and they must be done at the peril of one's life. For God has all power, and he cannot fail in any particular to do that which he is bound to do. Under the perfect law of Christ, every man's word is his bond, and all spoken statements are as true as though an oath attended each spoken word. See, if we live that higher word, then there's no need for oaths. Chapter 12, verses 38 to 39. Mercy to, to temper justice. We don't always have to seek justice at the law of every little thing. The law of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was a law of restoration or restitution not one of retribution. He didn't mean that if someone took your eye that you get to take their eye. What he's saying is you have equal restitution. If someone had injured or taken something, then there was to be a restitution of equal value, an eye, the value of an eye for an eye. Jesus is not saying that maybe we do not always have to ex exact justice all the time and mercy can be given instead. Contention leads to bitterness in the smallest of soul. Persons who contend with each other shrivel up spiritually and are in danger of losing their salvation. So important is to avoid this evil that Jesus expects his saints to suffer opposition and wrong rather than lose their inner peace and serenity through contention. So an eye for an eye meant that you gave 
equal restitution for something that was taken. It was never a law of retribution. That is what the world has turned into, and that is a misinterpretation of this. It was a law of restitution, that you restore of equal value of what you lost. But then he's saying, maybe sometimes you can just give mercy, and you don't always have to have justice for every little thing. Maybe there are times we just need to show mercy and forgive one another. Chapter 12, verses 40 through 42, persecution by legal process. Nothing is so important as the spread of truth and the establishment of the cause of righteousness. The petty legal process of that day must not be permitted to impede the setting up of the new kingdom. And so we shouldn't let petty legal processes inhibit us from living the gospel of Jesus Christ and going to the law for every petty little thing. Rise above that. Move on. Chapter 12, verses 43 to 47, the law of love. Of olden time and in ages past, Israel's enemies had been God's enemies, and the Gentile nations were kept away at sword's point. Had it not been so, the chosen people would have been swallowed up by the world. Their world was one of force and violence, in which whole nations were forced to believe what their rulers decreed or be destroyed from off the face of the earth. This tight grip on the minds of men has now been loosened, and now the gospel is to go to all the world. All men everywhere are to hear the world. Israel must love the Gentiles, for they are to be adopted into the family of Jehovah. So instead of hating thine enemies, as once was okay under the law of Moses, now you are to love your enemy, and love those who persecute you and who deliberately hate you. All men will be judged by what is in their own hearts. If their souls are full of hatred and cursings, such characteristics shall be restored to them in the resurrection. Loving one enemies and blessings one curses perfect loving one's curses perfects the soul. Such perfection is the object of the gospel and of how it Jesus now chooses to sp and of it Jesus now chooses to speak. The follower of Christ is not just to tolerate or avoid his enemies. No, in this matter, too, Jesus calls us to a higher righteousness. He bids us to do away with our enemies by making friends of them. All the while, however, even as we, even as we're, all the while, however, even as we're are praying for our enemies, we need to be praying for ourselves, that our hearts may be pure, fight of anger or bitterness or hatred. In time, the Holy Spirit will transform our lives, our vision, our perspective, our understanding of things as they really are. Enos is an example, example of what happened if we are to pray with fervor for our enemies. We must wrestle with God in prayer, obtain a remission of our sins, be born again in regards to things of the Spirit, and gain confidence with the Almighty. Then our prayers will begin to reach beyond our thoughts, and our circle of concern expand and broaden to include those who have previously held little place in, our, in either our thoughts or our prayers. Chapter 12, verse 45 that ye may be the children of, who, of your Father who is in heaven. That is, that you may become the sons and daughters of God, the Father, reinstated in the royal family through the blessings of the atonement and by means of the ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood. Chapter 12, verse 48, Perfection. Elder Bruce Army Conkey taught, If the newly called saints overcome anger, if they are reconciled with their brethren, if they rise above lewd and lascivious thoughts and commit no adultery in their hearts, if they cast away their sins as though severing an offending hand, if their every spoken word is true as though sworn with an oath, if they do not retaliate when others offend them, if they turn the other cheek and resist no evil imposition, if they love their enemies, bless those who curse them, and pray for those who despitefully use them and persecute them, if they do all these things, they will become perfect, even as their eternal Father is perfect. And perfection comes not by the law of Moses, but by the gospel. That's why the Savior ended the Sermon on the Mount of become perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's what all of this is leading to. It is leading to us to become perfect in Christ, 
not absent from him. We cannot do it alone. We become perfected in him. And the Beatitudes and these other higher laws that we've been talking about are ways we become perfected in Christ to get his image in our countenance. President Brigham Young taught, If the first passage I have quoted is not worded to your understanding, we can alter the phraseology of the sentence and say, Be ye as perfect as ye can, for that is all we can do. Though it is written, Be ye perfect as your Father who is heaven. Heaven is perfect. He cannot be any more perfect than he knows how, any more than we. When we are doing as well as we know how in the sphere and station which we occupy here, we are justified in the justice, righteous, mercy, and judgment that go before the Lord of heaven and earth. We are as justified as the angels who are before the throne of God. The sin that will cleave to all the posterity of Adam and Eve is they not, that they have not done as well as they know how. Brothers and sisters, you and I, as long as you and I are living up to the best we know how in our sphere, then we are being as perfect as we know how to be. Then the more that we learn, the more we become perfected in Christ. The more we learn to become like him, the more we learn to be like him. Like he said, the sin is that we do not live up to what we know all the time. As long as you live up to the best you can to what you know, then you're as being as perfect as you know how. That I can do. That I understand. That type of perfection and that progression I can work on this life and in the next. Joseph Smith counseled, When you climb up a ladder, you must begin at the bottom and ascend step by step until you arrive at the top. And so it is with the principles of the gospel. You must begin with the first and then go on until you learn all the principles of exaltation. But it will be a great while after you have passed through the veil before you will have learned them. It will be a great work to learn our salvation and exaltation beyond the grave. That is comforting too, brothers and sisters. This working on becoming perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect and as Jesus Christ is, is something we work on here and a long while even beyond the grave. The key is to die on the covenant path so that in the spirit world, you're on the covenant path and in paradise where Satan cannot tempt you. Satan cannot tempt anyone in paradise. Can you imagine how much faster we could progress once we get him off our back? Just stay on the covenant path. President James E. Faust explained that we must seek for perfection now so as to be able to attain it in the next life. Quote, perfection is our goal. While we cannot be perfect in mortality, striving for it is a commandment which ultimately, through the atonement, we can keep. So in other words, we should be about doing it, uh, going about trying to accomplish it, knowing that it will take this life and the next. President Spencer W. Kimball also explained the need to strive for perfection. Be therefore perfect, as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. Now that is an attainable goal. We will not be exalted. We shall not reach out our destination unless we are perfect. And now is the best time in the world to start towards perfection. I have little patience with a person who says, oh, nobody is perfect. The implication being, so why try? Of course, no one is wholly perfect, but we find some who are a long way up the ladder. In other words, President Skimble means that we should be about trying and accomplishing and working on it. We cannot excuse ourselves and not working on it and say, oh, well, nobody's perfect, and so I don't even have to try down here. No, we should be about trying and working on it. Let's now go to 3 Nephi chapter 13. 3 Nephi 1 through 24 is my motives. In 3 Nephi 12, Jesus taught us what we must do to inherit eternal life. He now turns to why of what I do. You can have the same outcome, but different motives that produce the outcome. For example, keeping the commandments. I could keep them because I want to please my parents. And you have the same outcome. You kept them. But but maybe they never become a part of you. They never become a part of your inner being. 
I may keep them because I'm afraid what others may say in the church. Or I can keep them because I love Christ. See, what's my motive for keeping them? If I keep them because I love Christ, then they help me to become like Christ. How about serving others? I could serve others because it's my duty, because I've been asked, and it's a calling. Or I can serve others because I love them. What is my motive? This is what chapter 13 is about. Making a comment in a gospel doctrine class. I have taught professionally 35 years in this church and then endlessly gospel doctrine classes during that same time. And I can tell when someone made a comment because they just wanted the people in the class to know how brilliant they were. Look, look at this neat insight that I have. That does not edify or uplift. What is my motive for making a comment in a gospel doctrine class? To show how knowledgeable I am? Or is it to add light knowledge to the lesson? If it is not to add light knowledge to the lesson, then be quiet and listen for the Holy Ghost then you are not to speak unless your only motive you have is to add light knowledge and the Spirit inspires you to make a comment. See, what is my motive for why I am doing things? As we have seen again and again, the Savior's sermon calls his followers to a higher righteousness. We ask, is there more than obedience? Is more than a careful attention to duty and appropriate behavior required of those who aspire to Christian principles? The answer is yes, an emphatic yes. Our Lord calls us to purity of heart, to purity of soul, to purity of motive. We are not only to do the right thing, we are to do them for the right reason. President Russell M. Nelson, speaking to graduates at the LDS Business College, says, This is a perfect time to set your priorities and make certain that, your move, that, your move, that you move in the right direction. He stressed, You do not want to be like the man who climbed the ladder of success, only to find that he was leaning against the wrong wall. I may be climbing the ladders of the principles of the gospel, brothers and sisters, but is my ladder up against the right wall? Am I, do I have the right motives? Am I doing it for the right reason? If not, then it will be as if I had never done them. Moroni expressed it this way when he said in Moroni 7, 8 through 11, For behold, if a man being evil gives the gift, he doth it. He doeth it grudgingly, wherefore it is counted unto him the same as if he had retained the gift, wherefore he is counted evil before God. And so likewise also it is counted evil unto man if he shall pray, and not with real intent of heart. It profiteth him nothing, for God receiveth none such. Wherefore a man being evil cannot do that which is good, neither will he give a good gift. For behold, a bitter fountain cannot bring forth good water, neither can a good fountain bring forth bitter water. Wherefore, a man being a servant of the devil cannot follow Christ, and if he follow Christ, he cannot be a servant of the devil. Brothers and sisters, if I go and serve someone, it may be of help to them. If I do it grudgingly, it doesn't help me to become like Christ. And if all my doing is not helping me to become, if I'm just doing because I'm asked to do and that's it, my motive is not to become like Christ, then it is as if I had never done it. That's why he says it means nothing to you. So if we do things grudgingly, then it doesn't help me to become like Christ. My doing must help me to become like him. I must have the right motive. Am I doing it because I love Jesus Christ and my fellow men? Chapter 13, therefore, with that thought in mind, verses 1 through 4, four doing alms, righteous acts of righteous devotion. Not to be done to be seen of men. The saints are always to care for the poor, to see their needs and wants, both temporally and spiritually. They are to do alms, to make offerings, or deliver gifts, or perform deeds of service. But these actions, important as they are, will not have the lasting impact they could otherwise be if we perform them selfishly, in, or, in order to have others notice the deed. Service that is self-serving is something less than service. Though we may not be evil individuals, yet to do good acts in order to be seen or noticed or heard is certainly, certainly less than noble and may be symptomatic of inner evil. 
A person who does good to be seen of others already has, in the words of the Master, his reward, the praise and the esteem of the observer. The unspoken part of the Savior's chilling warning is essentially, and let not such a person expect a reward hereafter. You don't get paid twice. If you serve or give alms or money to be seen of others, then there's your reward. Christ is not going to reward you again for doing it. Let not the left hand know what the right hand doeth is the call to avoid ulterior motivation. A warning against doing a deed ostentiously for one reason, in the name of appropriate and selfless service, when in reality in our heart of hearts we do the deed to impress others with our goodness. President Thomas S. Monson explained the value of anonymous service. I approached the reception desk of a large hospital to learn the room number of a patient I had come to visit. This hospital, like almost all others in the land, was undergoing a massive expansion. Behind the desk where the receptionist sat was a magnificent plaque which bore an inscription of thanks to donors who, made, who had made possible the expansion. The name of each donor who had contributed 100,000 appeared in a flowing script etched on an individual brass placard suspended from the main placard by a glittering chain. The names of the benefactors were well known. Captains of commerce, giants of industry, professors of learning, all were there. I felt gratitude for their charitable benevolence. Then my eyes rested on a brass placard which was different. It contained no name, one word. One word only was inscribed, anonymous. I smiled and wondered who the unnamed contributor could have been. Surely he or she experienced a quiet joy unknown to any other. A year ago, last winter, 1981, a modern jetliner faltered again after takeoff and plunged into the icy Potomac River. Acts of Bravery and feats of heroism were in evidence that day, the most dramatic of which was one witnessed by the pilot of a rescue helicopter. The rescue rope was lowered to a struggling survivor. Rather than grasping the lifeline to safety, the man tied the line to another, who was then lifted to safety. The rope was lowered again, and yet another was saved. Five were rescued from the icy water. Among them was not found the anonymous hero, Unknown by name, he left the vivid air sign with his honor. End of Brother Elder Monson's quote. May this truth service, or I'm sorry, that was the end of that story. Here's continuing his, his growth, his quote. May this truth serve us, guide our lives. May we look upward as we press forward in the service of our God and our fellow man. And may we incline an ear towards Galilee, that we might hear perhaps an echo of the Savior's teachings. Do not your alms before man to be seen of them. Let not your left hand know what thy right hand doeth. And of our good deeds, see that you tell no man. Our hearts will then be lighter, our lives brighter, and our soul richer. Loving service and honestly given by an unknown Given may be unknown to man, but the gift and the giver are known to God. End of quote. Chapter 13, verses 5 through 8. Prayer. Our prayers are offered to God, not to men. What is my motive for praying? Our yearnings for divine assistance are addressed to the man of holiness, not to unholy men and women. Perfect prayer is offered to the Father in the name of Christ, and it is spoken of, by the power of the Holy Ghost, such prayers are not delivered to impress others, but only to commune with our Maker. The prophet Joseph Smith understood this principle clearly. His petitions were frequent, his motives pure, and the blessings of heaven regular. Daniel Tyler, an associate of the prophet, recalled an important occasion, quote, at the time William Smith and other rebelled against the prophet of Kirtland, I attended a meeting where Joseph presided. Entering the schoolhouse a little before the meeting opened and gazing upon the man of God, I perceived sadness in his countenance and tears trickling down his cheeks. A few months later, a hymn was sung, and he opened the meeting with prayer. Instead of facing the audience, however, he turned his back and bowed upon his knees facing the wall. This, I suppose, was done to hide his sorrow and tears. I heard men and women pray, especially the former, from the inner from the most ignorant, both as to letters and intellect, to the most 
a learned and eloquent, but never until then had I heard a man address his maker as though he was present listening as a kind father would listen to the sorrows of a dutiful child. Joseph was at the time unlearned, but that prayer, which was to a considerable extent in behalf of those who accused him of have gone astray and fallen into sin, was that the Lord would forgive them and open their eyes that they might see aright. That prayer, I say, to my humble mind, partook of the learning and eloquence of heaven. There was no obstinate ostentation, no raising of the voice as by enthusiasm, but a plain, controversial tone, conversational tone, as man would address a perfect, a present friend. It appeared to me as though, in the case the veil were taken away, I could see the Lord standing, facing his humble of all servants I had ever seen. It was the crowning of all prayers I have ever heard. End of quote. Chapter 13, verse 7. When ye pray, use not vain repetitions. Vain means empty, worthless, having no substance, value, or importance. Our prayers are vain when we offer them out of habit, with little thought or feeling. The problem is in the vainness, not in repetition. In how many different ways can we bless our food? How many original prayers, original in the sense of novel or unusual language, can we offer? God is not offended by repetition, so long as the words are spoken from the heart and are sincere. The heavens withdraw themselves, however, in the face of vanity. Something is vain when it is empty, meaningless, or hollow. Whenever our prayers are meaningless and thus become trite or ritualistic religious jargon, having no feeling or, em or emanating from a du duplicitous heart, they accomplish little. Elder Joseph B. Wordland cautioned regarding repetition in prayer. Our prayers become hollow when we say similar words in similar ways over and over so often that the words become more of a recitation than a, than a communication. That is what the Savior described as vain repetitions. End of quote. Chapter 13, verse 8. Your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. What purpose is served, we might ask, we might inquire by asking God for something when he already knows our needs. For one thing, the spiritual discipline associated with getting in tune with the Spirit, suppressing our own selfless desires, putting away our own agenda, and opening our souls to the will of God. This method of prayer, of prayer in spirit, exposes us to the realization of our true needs. The Lord will bless us in terms of our needs, not just our wants. When we are inspired by the Holy Ghost, our prayers become instructive. We learn something from them, generally about ourselves. As we, through the Spirit, begin to gain the mind of Christ, we begin to think of God, thinks, and feel as God feels. Paul wrote that the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be understood. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. A modern revelation likewise instructs us that he that asketh in the Spirit asketh according to the will of God, wherefore it is done even as he asketh. The process whereby we become absolutely honest before God, honest in terms of that for which we should pray, is the process by which we come to gain answers to our prayers. So the true form of prayer, brothers and sisters, is to have the Holy Ghost inspire us what to say, and then we repeat those in our prayers. Chapter 13, verses 9 through 13, Jesus provides a pattern for prayer. The Lord's Prayer here contains some slight alterations from that in the New Testament, alterations appropriate to the Nephites, provides a simple yet profound approach to our Heavenly Father in prayer. The Savior gave this not so that it could be memorized and uttered forevermore in a place of either individual or group prayers, but rather that we might have a guide, a simple example of prayer. Henry B. Iron of the First Presidency taught, quote, The prayer begins with reverence for our Heavenly Father. Then the Lord speaks of the kingdom and its coming. The servant with the testimony that this is the true church of Jesus Christ feels joy in its progress and desire to give his or her all to build it up. The Savior himself exemplified the standard set by the next words of the prayer, Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. 
That was his prayer in the extremity of offering the atonement for all mankind and all the world. The faithful servant prays that even the apparent smallest task will be done as God would have it done. It makes all the difference to the work and to prayer for his success, to pray for his success more than for our own. Then the Savior set for us his, his standard of personal purity and forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The strength that we are to give those we watch over come from the Savior. Watch him. The strength in we are to give those who watch over comes from the Savior. We and they must forgive to be forgiven by Him. We and they can hope to remain clean only with His protection and with the change in our heart that the atonement makes possible. We need that change to have the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. You may have confidence in the Lord's service. The Savior will help you do what He has called you to do, be it for a time as a worker in the church or forever as a parent. You may pray for help enough to do the work and know that it will come. End of quote. Chapter 13, verses, I'm sorry, that's 14 through 15. Forgiveness, how we treat others. Complete forgiveness from the heart brings forgiveness of sin. We see from this that in one real sense we judge ourselves and hereafter by how we treat others. This is an aspect of discipleship that one, that may be one of the most difficult labors a Christian is called upon to perform. Our involvement in this work, however, makes us more like the merciful Jesus than anything else we might do. The German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer suggested that while only Christ's sufferings could bring the atonement with its benefits of forgiveness for all, his disciples too must bear the sins of others, other people's burdens, being supported in this by him who bore the sins of all. Quote, the passion, suffering of Christ, strengthens the disciple to overcome the sins of others by forgiving them. The only way to bear that sin is by forgiving it. The call to follow Christ always means a call to share the work of forgiving men their sins. Forgiveness is the Christ-like suffering, which it is the Christian's duty to bear. End of Bonhoeffer's quote. Chapter 13, verses 16 through 18. Sorry, that typo. Fasting. Do I quietly go about my fast to, or do others have to know how hard it is for me by my comments and facial expressions? The saints are to fast for the right reasons. That fasting may be a time of tragedy or sorrow when we need spiritual guidance or direction when we seek for remission of sins, when we are struggling with a particular difficult problem or challenge in life, or generally when we feel that we need to draw nearer to God. But fasting is an individual matter, though during the regular monthly fast we come together at church to teach and testify, and we enjoy social relations, all during the time of a fast, yet our fastings and our prayers are private. Fasting is something to be participated in, not something to be observed. A member of the church need not look the part of one who is fasting. In fact, our obedience and our observance of the fast needs need of the fast need to be hidden behind a pleasing appearance and a modest manner which would in no way draw attention to that which needs no attention. In general, then, our Redeemer calls us to a higher righteousness, to a higher motivation for righteousness, to a higher more elevated perspective on why we do what we do. In addressing an apparent paradox in the Sermon on the Mount, the command to let your light so shine before man versus the commandment, take heed that you do not your alms before man, again Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, how is this paradox to be resolved? From whom are we to hide the visibility of our discipleship? Are we to hide it from ourselves? We must be unaware of our own we are to hide it from ourselves. We must be unaware of our own righteousness and see it only insofar as we look unto Jesus. The Christian is a light unto the world, not because of any quality of his own, but only because he follows Christ and looks slowly upon him. 
all that the follower of, follower of Jesus has to do is to make sure that his obedience, following, and love are entirely spontaneous and unpremeditated. If you do good, you must not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Christ's virtue, the virtue of discipleship, can only be accomplished so long as you are entirely unconscious of what you are doing. The genuine work of love is always a hidden work. Thus, hiddenness has its counterpart in manifestation. For there is nothing hidden that shall not be revealed. God will, sh God will show us the hidden and make it visible. Manifestation is the appointed reward for hiddenness. And the only question is where we shall receive it and who will give it, give it us. If we want publicity in the eyes of men, we have our reward. If the left hand knows what the right hand is doing, if we have become conscious of our hidden virtue, we are forgiving our we are forgiving our own reward instead of that which God had intended us to give, to give us in his own good time. End of quote. How do we do this? What do we do if our motives are not always purest? Do we sit back and avoid deeds of service because our desires are not yet sanctified? Do we refrain from home or visiting teaching, for example, because our motivation is presented cloudily more by the spirit of inspection than the expectation and covenant? Certainly not. We have duties to perform, work to do in order to bear off the kingdom of God triumphant. And Zion, as well as its municipalities, its citizenry, is being established in the process of time. Simply stated, disciples do not wait to be transformed before they proceed in the work of the ministry. We are never justified in doing the wrong thing or ignoring the work to be done simply because we are not properly motivated. Rather, the saints are instructed again and again to seek the Spirit, to ask for, live for, and qualify for the gifts and fruits of the Spirit, which characterize the sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. As the Spirit begins to live in us, we to remake us, we come to love the things we beforehand hated and to hate the things we before loved. Because the Spirit is His Spirit, the works likewise becomes His work. Our service thereby is centered in Christ, our eyes single to His glory. So, if our motive isn't right, we continue. We go on with the work until your motive becomes work. You don't sit back and do nothing until your motive is pure. You work on it and work on it as you continue to do the works of Christ and keep his commandments and bring forth his kingdom. Chapter 12, verses 19 through 21, What I Treasure. Treasures in heaven, the character, perfections, and attributes which men acquire by obedience to law. Thus those who gain such attributes of godliness as knowledge, faith, justice, judgment, mercy, and truth will find these same attributes restored to them again in mortality. Whatever principle of intelligence we attain into this life will rise with us in the resurrection. The greatest treasure it is possible to inherit in heaven consists in gaining the continuation of the family unit in the highest heaven of the celestial world. Chapter 13, verse 21, the phrase, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That is, whatever we treasure, whatever we think on, ponder on, work for, and wear out ourselves to obtain will be the focus of our hearts. If we have spent our days laboring for mammon, we shall have a heart which is underdeveloped and uninterested in spiritual things, a heart which is also unequipped to abide a celestial glory. President Ezra Taft Benson referred to the temporary nature of our earthly treasures. Our affections are too often highly placed upon the paltry perishable objects. Material treasures of earth are merely to provide us, to provide us as it were, room and board while we are here at school. It is for us to place gold, silver, house, stocks, lands, cattle, and other possessions in their proper place. Yes, this is but a place of temporary duration. We are here to learn the first lessons towards exaltation, obedience to the Lord's gospel plan. End of quote. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles gave insight regarding the treasures we may lay up for ourselves. The Savior taught us that we should not lay up treasures on earth, but we should lay up treasures in heaven. In light of the ultimate purpose of the plan of happiness, I believe that the ultimate treasures on earth and in heaven are children and our posterity.
End of quote. Chapter 13, verses 22 through 23. What I pay attention to, that is my eyes, to the JST Matthew 6.22 says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, and Joseph Smith added, to the glory of God, then the whole body shall be full of light. If our eye or mind or soul is single to the glory of God, if our desires, our ambitions, our hopes and dreams are centered in the things of righteousness, if our greatest reason for serving is to build up the kingdom of God and establish in the earth the righteousness of God, if we are thus centered, then we will be spiritually transparent. The light of the Spirit of the Almighty God will shine through us, and we shall be a light to the world. If our will is subject to the will of heaven, then there is in us no hindrance to the power, the glory, the light of the Father. Others will see him in our countenances. Those who have and maintain an eye single to the glory of God are on the path which allows them now to see and understand things that are mysterious to the worldly, and that will lead them in the Lord's due time to the highest of spiritual rewards, the privilege of seeing him face to face. And if your eye be single to my glory, the Savior declared in 1832, your whole body shall be filled with light, and there shall be no darkness in you. And that body which is filled with light comprehendeth all things. Therefore sanctify yourselves that your minds become single to God, and the days will come that you shall see him, for he will unveil his face unto you, and it shall be in his own due time, and in his own way, and according to his own will. If we cease to serve with an eye single to the glory of God, if our spiritual eyes are dimmed by sin, by improper motives, if the light that once was ours turns to darkness, oh, how great is that darkness. Chapter 13, verse 24, No man can serve two masters. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, quote, Light and darkness cannot dwell together. It cannot be both day and night at the same time. Water cannot be both sweet and bitter and salty at the same hour. No man can serve God, who is the author of light and righteousness, while he is in the employ of Lucifer, who is the author of darkness and sin. Mammon is an Aramaic word for riches. You cannot serve God and love riches and worldliness at the same time. As Robert Millet, professor and religion professor at BYU, wrote, quote, Holding back or giving less than is required always produces a divided loyalties. We need not have our membership records in the great and abominable church in order to be disloyal to the kingdom of God. The issue is not where our records are, but rather where our hearts are. Our hearts cannot be wedded to another endeavor. Our might or, sh or strength cannot be spent in secondary causes. Our minds cannot be committed to another enterprise. In the words of the early brethren of this dispensation, it must be the kingdom of God or nothing. End of quote. There neither are nor can be any neutrals in this war, Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught. Every member of this church is on one side or the other. In this war, all who do not stand for courageously and valiantly are by that fact alone abating, ab aiding the cause of the enemy. They who are not for me are against me, saith our God. We are either for the church or we are against it. We either take its part, take it, its part or we take it the consequences. We cannot survive spiritually with one foot in the church and the other in the world. We must make the choice. It is either the church or the world. There is no middle ground. End of quote. Chapter 13 verses 25 through 34. We noted from verse 25 that Jesus now turns to the 12 to address, address the following words. Counts to address the following words counsel, which is particularly relevant to those called to full-time ministry and service. In principle, all members of the church should operate their lives in harmony with these guidelines, but as a matter of daily practice, they pertain specifically to the 12 of that day. Chapter 12, verse 25, take no thought for your life. The Lord's directive to the Twelve is to avoid anxiety about the necessities of life. People need, not, people need to eat. They require clothes and shelter to survive the storms of the day and the cold of the night. As the next verse indicates, these needs would be supplied for them. Chapter 13, verses 26-32, Behold the fowls of the air. 
These verses essentially repeat the divine charge to 12, and by extension, at least in principle to all of us, to avoid anxiety and undue worry about the food and clothing and shelter. If the God of heaven chooses to feed the fowls of the air, if he provides means for the growth and beautification of grass and flowers on the earth, then will he not help us provide for the crowning creatures of his creative enterprise, man? Christ calls on us to focus our focus on first things and then make proper efforts to provide for our needs. The message here follows on the heels of that which was just considered. One cannot have an eye single to the glory of God in the present if he spends every waking thought fretting about the future. Chapter 13 verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. The Joseph Smith translation of the Galilean sermon, the one in the New Testament, alters this verse slightly. It says, Wherefore, seek not the things of the world, but seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God and establish his righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you. One challenge we face on earth is to remember why we do what we do. It is not easy in a world with distractions, many of which seem to be good and noble and upright, to remain focused on fundamentals and riveted on matters of everlasting consequence. The duty of disciples is to discern and where necessary, discard. Knowing that we cannot do everything, the follower of the Nazarene chooses to do that which is of greatest worth. Chapter 13, verse 34, Sufficient is the day unto the evil thereof. This is the master's way of saying, there's enough to worry about today without making ourselves sick over tomorrow. For example, there's enough evil and temptation in today's world without fretting over what we will face in the future. Focus on today and what needs to be done for today and seek the mind of Christ in doing it. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for watching. Hopefully this helped you with the first two chapters of the Sermon on the Mount. If it did, please hit the like button.